polls to your camera. Now that you've seen the test results with the actual facts, let's go and do some heavily opinion-based ranting. Again, that you should take with a grain of salt because what do I know? I, I don't work on film sets or shoot documentaries. However, you sell yourself too short, Gerald. This is Gerald Undone. Of course, you probably know him because he's great. He makes awesome videos. And I wanted to pull up this section of his Sony Burano review, Master of None video that he posted recently. Because there's a part that in here kind of stood out to me. And I wanted to play it and kind of talk about it because it struck me as interesting. From somebody who cares a lot about value and can compare a lot of cameras, I do have trouble with the value proposition of the Burano. Allow me to explain. I've already... So this is something interesting that he's about to get into, which is, you know, price to value. A lot of times I've talked about things being too expensive. And in the comments, people like to say, what are you talking about? If you're, it's a professional tool, it's going to make you money. What does it matter how much it costs? And that the value is lost, I think, when, when we have those types of, of conversations. Yes, you can make as much money as you're able to make with your skill set and your tools. And at the end of the day, if you can afford a $50,000 camera, go ahead and get it. If it doesn't matter, if you're making millions. But still, the price of something should reflect the value that it provides. I've already established that it's basically an Alpha One from a sensor performance perspective. In fact, it's slightly worse. Uh, the rolling shutter is worse, and it doesn't have as many modes as the Alpha One when it comes to speeding that up if you want to improve the rolling shutter. So I would I really highly recommend you go watch this video, and that's why I'm not going to play it in its entirety. I just want to play this section, but there's a lot of fascinating stuff that Gerald talks about in this Sony Burano review. And dynamic range-wise, it's the same once you've sort of fully processed your image. The only advantage this has is that you don't have to fully process your image if you don't want to, but I suppose you could go the ninja pro res raw route with the alpha one and then it starts to kind of equalize those differences so a lot of what's going to set the burano apart are things that are very specific and hard to tell that they're worth five times the price an example one would be genlock so if you're doing xr or some kind of virtual production thing it's got it and then other cameras don't so i mean but then you can make the argument, what about the FX9? Because in the 6K mode, the FX9 has similar rolling shutter and has Genlock and is like half the price. So if you just need Genlock, and that's really your defining need, is this what you're going to spend? And then what about the fact that you can get like a Venice 1 used or other cameras that probably have Genlock for less than 25K? You, can, you can't spend 25K just for Genlock is my point. But it is something yeah, hear a lot of people that sure as hell the mirrorless cameras can't provide. Needing or wanting Genlock. Now, like I said, I haven't comments. tested the XLR inputs, sure, the time code or whatever. I'm just assuming it, that but... this many generations in, Sony has those things figured out and, and they can nail them. And so we'll, we'll assume that they all work excellently. But again, that's not really a separating fact because you can get a module. Sony makes one for mirrorless cameras that gives you XR, XLR inputs. And you can figure out time code and stuff like that for your mirrorless. You can rig it all up. You can rig it up at a V-mount plate. You can put cage parts on it. So all that isn't... Like what makes it a cinema body isn't something that you you can't turn a mirrorless camera into with hurdles. Now, yeah, you've got your sort of like nice, all your buttons are on one side. Nice buttons. I would disagree. This is my biggest gripe with the cinema style cameras is the buttons. Uh, Gerald's going to get into it, but the, the kind of catering to the old school legacy market still sort of has its place. There's plenty of people who want the buttons and all of that, but I don't think it necessarily makes a good camera especially when we're looking at it from a more modern or if you didn't, if you're not familiar with all the buttons and you're not familiar with the cinema cameras, I don't think they actually provide a lot of value to you. I'm not looking at a camera going, Oh, I need more buttons. I think that's a very old school thing. I've never been sold on that, but again, I don't work on film sets. I find this thing and this type of uh, interface to be more cumbersome to use for multiple reasons. One, anytime you switch modes, the camera like restarts. If you want to get in a menu, you got to hold buttons. There's like weird dials and stuff. When you've held a camera in your hand for so long and you're like, I can just do everything with my thumbs, it feels so much faster. It's like comparing a joystick to a PS5 controller, in my opinion. It just doesn't, it's not the same. But, but again, this is, what, this, is what, this is what works in certain industry things. So if you need that, there it is. And you can't really mod that out too much on a mirrorless camera. So this is the interesting fracture in the market where for so long, things were done a certain way in Hollywood and TV and, and however, and it all kind of, the stuff was built for that purpose. And 
it still has a purpose. It still has a function. Cameras like the Barana will sell. People will want to use them. But there's this new creeping segment of the market that goes, like, why do I want to deal with like the bigger bulk, the more buttons, the more clunky, cumbersome menus and interfaces when I can do all of this in a hybrid camera? You know, think your content creator types, your YouTubers, your vloggers, who oftentimes I think make better content than some so-called professionals. But that's beside the point. There's plenty of people who the Burano will serve just fine. But in 10 years, if you grew up and you came into the industry through mirrorless, through hybrid, through content creation, are you going to want to go the Burano route or are you going to want something more nimble, more flexible, more dynamic like a mirrorless hybrid camera? And then you could say it's got built-in NDs. And that's also true. And built-in NDs are sweet compared to putting Agreed. weird screw-on fillers on the front of your lenses. Although, Agreed. if we're making a cinema rig, you would use a matte box and use high-quality filters and not ones that, you know, you rotate and do weird things. But Robert Machado did a great video. Also, that's the video you should be watching instead of this bozo ramble about it because he's actually used the camera in proper applications. I really like his video, by the way. It's excellent. Uh, really objective, really it's balanced. Go check it out. Uh, he talked a lot about the IR pollution that he was getting on this camera. He showed some shots where your blacks were like red and it was strong and it was bad. So then you have to say, and he's talking about putting filters on the front of his lenses to get rid of that. So now I'm thinking, well, if you're putting filters on the front of your lenses anyway, how advantageous is that built-in uh, ND? You know, how is that a cell? I'm surprised this is still an issue. I ran into this problem years and years ago on the original Ursa Mini. Uh, before the 4.6K, before the G2, Blackmagic Design, the original Ursa Mini had terrible IR pollution, uh, especially when you're using the ND filters, and had to go the IR cut filter route, screwing it onto the front of the lens. And it was the, it was like the thing, like, don't forget, if you're using this camera and you change the lenses, make sure that you put this IR cut filter on front. Otherwise, you'll have magenta blacks. You'll have all that IR pollution. And Black Magic Design, I mean, I think they realized that this was a terrible flaw and they got they fixed it on every camera since. They were like, yep, we're doing ND filters, but like we got that IR cut built in, like you're good, you're golden. So I'm surprised that this is still a thing plaguing cameras in the current day and age. It's a selling point now. Well, it's got IBIS and it's got autofocus and it's got ND. Okay, and that's true. And I did do some mild testing on the IBIS and the autofocus and they're both good. For some reason, the cinema camera autofocus always feels to me slightly worse than the mirrorless autofocus, which makes sense. If the Alpha 1 is one generation ago, and the current generation is the one with all the AI processing chips, like the A7R5 and onward, this camera would be the generation before the Alpha 1 in terms of how I feel like it performs. Small things, like I pointed it at my, my kid who was drinking from his, his like little sippy cup. And when he had the cup here, both had I, and it was both great. When he brought the sippy cup up, the Alpha One was like, there's still an eye there. This camera's like, I don't see an eye. And I just like did some weird face thing and like tracked the cup. And it was still exciting. It's so interesting to me to be putting the benefits of mirrorless, of hybrid cameras, that IBIS, autofocus, the things that for the longest time, even the built-in ND filters, for the longest time, if you went on the Red Forums or you talked to people who shot with the Alexa, why would you want built-in NDs? That's like a broadcast thing. That's ENG. We don't need built-in NDs. We don't want IBIS. We're, we have <laughs> steady cams and Dana Dollies. We've got all this stuff. We don't need IBIS. We don't need autofocus. We've got people to do that for us. And yet, slowly but surely, all the amazing benefits that have snuck in there through hybrid content creation have now worked their way up to the Burano level which is maybe not top tier, but it's it's on it's on the way up there. It's a cinema camera. It's at least priced like one. It looks like one. So it's the benefits with the same form factor, same styling, same ergonomics of these cinema cameras. And I'm wondering what like why? What who is that for? If the traditional people working in Hollywood and, and TV want this type of camera. I always heard they didn't want the built-in NDs. They didn't want the IBIS. They didn't want the autofocus. Well, they, they kind of caught on, didn't they? You know, according to this camera, they figured it out. Oh, hey, internal NDs. That's helpful. That's useful. Oh, IBIS. That's helpful. That's useful. Oh, autofocus. I could use that. Couldn't you also use <laughs> menus that are easier to navigate? 
less buttons that get in the way. I feel like anytime I use a camera like this, I'm even as familiar as I get with it, I'm still hunting down which button do I need to press for this function? How long do I hold it? The value is supposed to be that the, the, the buttons are a click away. It's right there. But then you think that was not true for cell phones. That's never been true. The whole BlackBerry, well, there's a button for everything mindset. How are you going to know, know what to do? It's an iPhone. There's no buttons. You're going to be confused. Look at the apps, look at the interfaces and how smart and sophisticated smartphones actually are compared to what they used to be with like a bajillion buttons on them. Having more buttons doesn't make it better. Think of a universal remote. You go to your friend's house, they got the remote with just a million buttons on it. And how do I even turn the TV on? I can't even, I can't even do it. You had to have like, it's like a speaking a foreign language almost. You just like, no, oh, we hit this button and then this button, then you do that. And then that's, how do I change the input? How do I control the volume? This giant remote control with all these buttons. You know what remote controls look like now? It's like a Roku remote. It's up, down, left, right. It looks like a video game controller because I think you can play video games on some Roku remotes. A couple buttons, up, down, left, right, power on. They even have like the quick buttons you don't even need. That'll take you straight to Disney. I don't know anyone that uses those. Maybe it's good for kids. They just hit the Disney button. Simple, streamlined, fast, efficiency. These things are lost when we hold ourselves to, well, I need buttons. I need it to be look this certain way because that's that's what works on a film set. That's what that's what did work in the past, but you could adapt, modify, maybe a little bit, like I don't know. Acceptable, but the Alpha One was better. Certainly usable, and it's certainly very good, but it's not the best. And yet this camera costs so much, right? And then Ibis, same thing. It's there and it's cool, but there's a lot of limitations on when you can use it. Like there's there's multiple modes of the Ibis, right? Just like on a mirrorless camera. But what's cool with the Alpha One is that say you were in that 4K pixel bin mode. Well, now you can turn everything on. You can turn IBIS on active, you can do whatever because it's just deciding how much of the 8K it's going to read from. Where on this camera, because so many of the modes were about that crazy full frame 6K crop thing they're doing or the 8K modes, you can't really turn everything on until you're like at super 35 and also not in RAW. Because if you're in RAW, you can't you know, turn on a lot of the weird things like focus breathing compensation and stuff like that. So again, it's cool. It has so many mirrorless camera functions. Like I didn't mention, but you've got Distortion compensation uh, for when you're using e-mount lenses, obviously, right? You got distortion, you got peripheral illumination, you got focus breathing compensation, you've got those active stabilization modes. They're all in there, but you're only using them when you're already at a crop and you're not in raw. So you're shooting super 35, you know, HEVC mode, then you can turn a bunch of stuff on. And at that point, it's like, I, I'm just using a mirrorless camera and you're not using the ND filters because they have IR pollution. So... <laughs> People will say, well, you need the bigger box to put more fans, to put more cooling, to put more power, to put more processing, to put more stuff in there. And that's why it costs more. But then all the limitations to use any of the functionality mean, you know, you're recording less resolution, you're recording less of the sensor, you're not recording in the highest codecs. And you wonder, so what am I, what am I paying for just to get back down to like, to use the features, the so-called features that we say we want, the autofocus, the IBIS, the stuff. Well, those are good features. We want them. But to do that, we have to limit the camera. But I thought I was paying more money to get those features. Like the, the mirrorless cameras are the ones that should be limited in, in theory, right? In the price point, in the marketplace. Oh, well, it's smaller. It costs less. Should be more limited. But then the same is true even for the bigger camera that's more expensive. So then you're just wondering, well, why, why am I paying more for something that's clunkier to use? So you're putting filters on the front of your lenses. It just, it gets really confusing. So then it becomes, well, this thing is a lot more reliable. And I cannot take that away from it. This thing is a tank. It's heavy, but it's built like a tank. It's got a fan inside with control on it. All the things that the Alpha One doesn't have. And... I feel like in a hot environment, this camera is going to dump all over the Alpha One in terms of performance. I hate that heating, overheating has become a thing ever since the Canon R5. Every camera now, is it, it going to overheat? Is it going to overheat? Oh, it's got fans in it. It won't overheat. How hot can you film? That freaking Canon R5 would just be the bane of my existence, that camera. Didn't even overheat. 
It was a it was a fake limitation of the camera. It was, <laughs> but now every camera, it's this excuse, this justification. Well, oh, it overheats. This was not a thing until 2021. Wasn't even a consideration because <laughs> cameras just worked. Oh, these are the specs it can do. Yeah, it can record them. It was never like, well, it can do that, but only for 30 minutes until it overheats. It can only do that for like an hour until it overheats. I'm trying to think of any camera that over that was <laughs> had heating issues before the Canon R5. And even that one didn't have overheating issues. It was all smoke and mirrors to get you to think, oh, this is this isn't a cinema camera. Don't, don't, don't use this for cinema. This is a photography camera with some cinema features built in because we know you like them and we want to give them to you, but we also want you to go buy our expensive cinema cameras. We can't give you too much good stuff in the R5. But there are things you can do with the Alpha 1. I've shown some pretty cool stuff in my videos where if you put a Ninja 5 on it, you can set the camera to 8K, but record externally to the Ninja 5 in 4K, basically recording an oversampled 4K mode automatically to an SSD in ProRes, if you want. ProRes 422 10-bit. That's a great codec to work with. Put a dummy battery in this thing, rig it all over the cage, and it's not going to be this reliable, but I've never had that overheat, and I can record for a really long time with the camera set to 8K. If you want to record 8K internal RAW, then yeah, you're going to need a big monster with like a fan and stuff like that. But there's media differences too. Like this thing's using, uh, Sony sent over with it their, their new two terabyte CF Express Type B cards two tough cards. I, think, I don't know what these things cost, but they're probably like thousands of dollars, right? And uh, and I, I don't get to keep these, by the way. They go back with the part of the, the trial unit here. And so that media is crazy expensive. Where my little ProRes 422 thing, it's the cost of a Ninja and some SSDs. So it's hundreds of dollars. Here. But there isn't one thing I can think of that it does better than any other camera that does that thing on its own. Even if it's like, how fast can you shoot 8K with 12 and a half stops of dynamic range. It's like, well, not quite as fast as the Alpha 1. Well, can you shoot 4K as fast as the A7S III? I cannot, unless I do a 2X crop. There's always like a caveat. I am happy, however, that it exists because it's like, look what can exist. So I'll wrap it up here because you should really watch Gerald's whole video. I don't know how I feel about this because it's the same praise that the Apple Vision Pro gets. This isn't the thing that's good, but it will get us to the thing that's good. If the Burano is the stepping stone, I, I mean, I'll accept it. I'll take it. I'm not going to say no to more technology in the future. I don't think things should be stuck at a standstill. We shouldn't still be filming with the A7S Mark II. We shouldn't still be shooting on the 5D Mark III. We shouldn't still be limited to just the GH3 or the GH4. We do need progress and advancement but i think those stepping stones along the way should still be good they should feel secure when you step on it to say that yes this is the direction i want to head not tentatively thinking okay well like i guess i'll deal with it so that i can get to the next thing because at that point you're just buying something that you know has no longevity it doesn't actually check all the boxes that you wanted to, even though on paper, the specs might check all the boxes, but all those limitations. Now, that's not to say if you need the Burano for work, if that's what the producer wants, that's what the client wants, that's what the project calls for, by all means, get one if you have that level of consistent work, rent one if you have a project that comes up, I'm sure it will do the job. But it's kind of a, a good, I don't know, case study on where things are you have so much legacy and history still grounding things in being kind of big being kind of bulky needing to be expensive because that's premium that's pristine but then you have this this breaking point i feel like a, a lot of us are reaching where the mirrorless cameras are so good we should embrace that. I don't want to say it's the solution for every project. There's still a time and a place for a really high-end red camera or an Alexa or a Sony Venice or Burano or whatever it might be. But the mirrorless cameras are still looked down upon as if that's like for photographers. 
still to this day, even though, gosh, we've been shooting video on them for 15, 20 years almost, whatever it's been since the oh, like 2009, 2008. It's been a long time that hybrid production has been a possibility. People who seize that opportunity to create really cool content, I think, have reap that reward. There's no need necessarily to have the camera with more buttons and to pay the premium just to have that because somehow that's better. I don't think that's true anymore. I think things should over time, technology should get cheaper. It should get smaller. Again, look at phones. <laughs> if the phone was still designed with the original cell phone kind of ethos aesthetics in mind. Well, I need an antenna for good signal. I need big buttons. So I know what I'm doing. How am I supposed to type if I can't, if I don't have buttons, keeping holding on to that, if it has a good reason, maybe, but I, I, but I don't, I think change is inevitable and you're, and you're seeing people say, well, I want it to look and feel a certain way so I can do these certain things. And then I'm asking myself like, why though? Why? Why not? Why not experience the 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 great joy <laughs> of a rig that doesn't break your back, that doesn't need all the support, that doesn't need massive batteries? You can use them if you want to, but doesn't require it. You look at something like the Creator shot on the FX3, I believe. That was the big news, the big marketing stunt that was shot on the FX3. That's incredible. What an achievement! Does it make the film lesser? Is a movie better when it's shot on IMAX and the camera is massive? I don't think it has anything to do with the substance of the story or the quality of the content. I think it might tell you a little about a little bit about the filmmaker and the people behind it and their preferences and why they prefer film because the aesthetics, they like it. Does it does a v audience member care? Do they look at it and go, oh, I can tell? Or are they watching the characters and the story? and the actual substance of the content. I think to put yourself, to jump through the hoops of, well, that's what cinematography is. That's what professionals do. You will only ever just repeat the past. You'll only ever do what's already been done. Because if you just follow the formula, you follow the template, and that's what professionals do, and that's what I, so that's what I do. You never innovate, you never advance. You never learn what's possible. You never experiment with the creative freedom that's allowed when the camera fits in one hand. And I'm not saying that you should film a movie on a GoPro or that you should shoot you know, everything on an iPhone. But using the tools when they do make sense in this point where Gerald is talking about the Burano versus the Alpha One going, what's the difference other than form factor, other than a few features that you might pick apart and say, well... A little bit more reliable, a little bit more, but but if anything, that's you can't even say that that's true for every mirrorless camera because a lot of them are super reliable. So I don't know. I don't know what to take away from it other than it was very interesting to watch Gerald have this <laughs> have this conversation with himself, exploring these thoughts of of kind of wondering out loud and talking through all the specs, and then to see that in where we are as professionals in the industry, you know, talking about cameras and, and how we put stuff together. I just think it's so fascinating that there's still this conflict and there always will be because different people have different preferences. It's all very subjective. And if you prefer the bigger camera and all the buttons for a certain reason, I more power to you. I think that's awesome. You should use what you prefer to use, but then you wonder like, why does it cost more? Does it need to? Or can you do a lot of that with something smaller and cheaper? Or could you have put more into it? You've got all that extra space. Could you have made it better? Well, then it would have to cost even more because the specs are so much greater. But does it need to be? I wonder. I don't know the answer. I don't design these cameras, so I can't say one way or the other. But I do know that the mirrorless hybrid cameras are incredibly powerful. The sensors are there, right? The sensors get used in, I mean, 
a lot of the sensors are, are more or less the same. It's the processing power. It's the hardware behind it. It's the box you put it in that kind of changes some of those flavors. But at the end of the day, a camera is more or less just a sensor. It'd be like, like film. You're recording the image to the film itself. The camera helps allow that hap to happen. It gives you controls. But at the end of the day, the film is what matters. It's like the sensor is what matters. So as long as you can use that sensor to its fullest, does it matter what the camera looks like? Does it matter how many buttons are on it? Does it matter the interface? It does to a certain extent of like what's usable, what you want to be using, what's comfortable, what's lightweight, what can you take with you, what allows you to bring other things with you. Because it's not just the camera, it's the lights, it's the audio, it's all of it, especially if you're doing it yourself or with a small team. So I do find it very interesting to just see how things are playing out, seeing how, oh, the Burano. And then going, oh, the Burano. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, what's Nikon doing now that they got red? What's next for Panasonic? What are they doing now that their cinema and broadcast and Lumix is all kind of under the same roof, so to speak? How's this all going to shake out? Where, where are things headed? If, if I'm a YouTuber and I grew up shooting on DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, and I'm not saying I, I'm just saying if, my first camera, technically, I think the first thing I ever shot on was a Canon XL1. As far as like professionally, I use like a camcorder, my dad's camcorder, Hi8 tape. That was actually like at home. But professional camera, I'd say the Canon XL1. And then from there was like the DVX 100, the HVX 200. But then like the GH1, and you wonder, okay, if your first camera, for someone, maybe their first camera was the 5D Mark II, or maybe their first camera was the A7S. As they advance, as they create more, as the YouTuber creator economy continues to grow and expand, and people are, I mean, the color grading nowadays on YouTube videos is incredible. The lighting, the cinematography on a YouTube video, on someone's vlog. Are you going to want to go buy a Burano or a, a big cinema camera? I'm saying in the future, if you're working on a movie or something, where are you going to use what's familiar and comfortable because of those advantages beyond the IBIS, beyond autofocus? I think internal NDs is a huge selling point. And that's one thing I, I harp on the most is we need these cameras to get built-in electronic ND systems. But from there, there's advantages of the form factor, of the size. And yet, that's often dismissed as, well, yeah, but that's for photography. Why? And how often are you shooting something cinematography style and you want to take a photo? Looking at this table that Gerald's got in front of him, I know which one I'd rather take the photo with. And I also know which one I'd rather shoot the video with. And it happens to be one in the same camera. I think that says a lot to just where we are, how we do what we do, why we do what we do. And I'd use a, a Burano, you know, I'd use any camera if it does the job that I need it to. Love the Ursa Mini. Ursa Mini is a great camera. But even though it's arguably better at certain things, it's not easy to take a photo with. And if I have to bring yet another camera to take a photo, and oh, by the way, that camera happens to be something like a GH6, a G9 Mark II, and maybe even some of the Sony mirrorless hybrid cameras, what advantages am I, get, am I getting from the Ursa Mini? Oh, it's got XLR? Well, these other cameras, I can <laughs> have an XLR adapter. Oh, the Ursa Mini doesn't have IBIS. It's got built-in NDs, so that's something. But I can't take a photo with it. So if I need to take a thumbnail, I need to get shots for an article or something. Can't. I mean, you could pull a screenshot, but that's not really. Even the pocket cinema camera is more in line, and I think more popular because of it, with that kind of photography form factor 
but still a powerful cinema camera. I don't know where things will go and what, and what people will want, but it seems like there's a lot of advantages. Photography has been around for a long time. Photographers really figured it out. This is what feels good to hold. This is what feels good to shoot. Even the controls for the most part, they're not standardized, but I wish they were between manufacturer camera manufacturers because there is kind of that preferred layout, I think, in the way that Xbox perfected the video game controller. There's a lot of cameras out there that just, they feel perfect. And it doesn't matter if you're taking photo or video, pictures or moving pictures. It's kind of one and the same. So why not lean into that strength? Why not use that form factor? Use that that legacy, that history of, hey, this is this is what works really well because it feels good and you can do a lot with a little. Not appropriate for you know every every environment, but I think back and I go, film cameras, man, they were big, but they were big because they had a lot of film on them. Like that was like the film because it, it, it was physical space. And you needed tripods and things to support that. And photo, it's, you know, you got your small little roll because you're just taking one shot at a time. Moving pictures, you need lots and lots of film. And yet for cinema, we've held on to that size as being valuable. And I don't think you'll break that. <laughs> things that are bigger tend to be valued more. It's just, oh, wow, it's, a, it's something expensive. But that reality of like perception is not the reality of practicality of how you use things. So there's just things I like to keep in mind as I approach my own projects, as I pick what is the right tool for the job, what's going to allow me to get the most, to create more content more efficiently. Just thought it was interesting. Just wanted to share.